Good morning, Sun Valley. Uh, this morning's scripture reading will be from Isaiah 6, verses 5 through 10. Isaiah 6, verses 5 through 10. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and, whom, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say this to people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the, make the heart of, it, of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and and turn and be help and be healed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Sun Valley Church of Christ, we are so glad to be here, glad to uh, be here with you, being with our God today, worshiping, uh, giving him our heart, our soul, our attention, our total focus. We are grateful that our God has called us together for this great event we call worship. It's a day the Lord has made. We should be rejoicing and be glad in it. Um, I am rejoicing and being glad because it is a beautiful day. I'm looking out and I'm seeing people that I haven't seen before. That is great. Uh, welcome. We love having you and know that uh, we would like you to come back. Hopefully at our next appointed time, which is at 6 o'clock, for those of you that might be wondering that, we will come together again for another portion of God's Word at 6 o'clock this evening. We'd like to see you there. And uh, we also want to welcome all our members. So we're grateful that you have uh, taken this opportunity. To come together this busy time of year uh, when things get hectic, things get crazy. Um, but it is a beautiful day that God has blessed us with. And he's given us an opportunity to enjoy it through different eyes. As we heard from Isaiah, that not everybody will see the day as it should be seen. Not everybody will hear the word from God as it should be heard. But you and I have been blessed with the opportunity to hear. You know, we hear a lot of things in life, and it seems like the longer we're here, the longer our mind, the older our mind gets, we start thinking like old people. But you know, a friend and I were doing some talking about that one day over the phone, and he reminded me, he said, well, you don't want to irritate older people because the older people get, the less life in prison is a deterrent. Yeah, we don't want to make, you don't want to make those mature people upset. Right, Miss Peggy? <laughs> we don't want to upset people. Hey, you know, that's what God's Word does. It does. It, it, it upsets some people. But we get an opportunity to take a different mindset, if you will to see things from a different point of view, from a different perspective, to see things the way that God wants us to. Now, to do that, folks, if you're leaving here with nothing more than this, you're leaving with a gold mine, we got to change. Remember in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, Paul said, the mindset on the flesh will not change. And it's going to cause death. I want to go to Colossians chapter 3, and I want us to look at verses 1 through 3, because if we're going to change, we should change. When we're baptized, that change should start taking effect. The change in the way we hear things, the way we see things, the way, hear me, the way we know things. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, and that's what we call a first-class conditional sentence, which means it could be 
translated as since you've been raised up with Christ. Folks, if you don't think anything more of yourself, think of yourself as somebody who has, hear me, been raised up with Christ. Wow. You know, that, that means a lot, Don. That when this book was written in, to, the, to the congregation in Colossae, he had you in mind. You were raised up with Christ. And since you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Don't think of things in the worldly view, but think of things from the higher perspective. Seated with Christ Jesus in that eternal realm where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, the power and authority of God. Think everything according to that, that frame of mind. Power and authority of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Don't worry about the trials and the difficulties and the bills we got to pay and all the things that are associated with this physical life, but put your mind, fix your mind, set your mind upon things that God has offered us in that heavenly realm. For you have died. I know that comes maybe as news to some. But if the baptism was right, then we have died. If we went into that water with the right frame of mind, we no longer want to live. I don't want to live that old way. I don't want to live that old life. I have died. I've been raised to walk in a newness of life. Your life is hidden with Christ. In other words, it's never going to be fully known until we go home. Hidden, Greek word means hidden until revealed, right? God is going to reveal the perfect life once we go home and spend that eternity with God. You know, I say it all the time. We all have opinions. Opinions are good sometimes. Most of the time they're not. But opinions are like noses, right? Everybody's got one and sooner or later you're going to blow it. We all get that. So what do we do? Well, we, we listen to God. We listen to what that says. And we say, God wants me to change the way I think about things. So today I want us to maybe see things from a different perspective, see things the way that God wants us to see them. Open our eyes to a new horizon, a new vision, and grow with our understanding. Because see, what Satan tries to do, he tries to keep us chained to the world. Our fleshly minds, we've got to die to them because if not, we're going to stay tied to death. We're going to stay tied to that end that only flesh comes to. Let's start looking at relationships differently. Now, we're going to touch on this. I, I know brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, I, I get that. But do, I'm not talking about th just those kind of relationships. We're going to think of reality differently. Uh, definitely. There is a definite reality to life. We don't see the book. We don't see the word. We don't see the future. We don't see sin as the world sees it. We see it as definitely. God says it, so we believe it. And so it is. And then our response. Do what we do deliberately. There's a reason we do what we do. There's a reason this water waits behind me. There's a reason for that. It's deliberate, folks, and we want to grab onto that because it all starts with seeing things in this world which we're related to because we're all in some kind of relation. Let me tell you something, folks. The world is in a relationship with God. It's a bad relationship, but it's a relationship. You and I are in a relationship called a covenant relationship. A covenant relationship is a relationship that the covenant is called a suzerain covenant, which means the points are all laid out. There is no debate. There's no discussion. There's no wondering about it. God said this. You accept it or you don't. That's a suzerain covenant. And that's what God has offered us. And so we are part of that covenant. We repented of the old life. We were baptized and God washed away that sin. And now we are raised to walk in the newness of life. So everything around us that we once had a relationship with, hear me out, we once had a relationship, now has changed. It's different. It's different because I'm different. It's different because I am no longer tied to the world. I am not bound to the world. See, the world works through deceit, delusion, and destruction. 
Now, I want us to understand this. Over in John chapter 10, if we look at uh, verse 10, Jesus, dealing with false teachers here in John 10.10, 10, uh, he says very clearly, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So the context here, of, of course, talks about the false teachers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the, the false identification, the false relationship with the law. Are you hearing me? That relationship had to change. Why? Because their relationship came with the idea of deceit, right? Steal, kill, and destroy. Now, I know the context is talking about the false teachers, but the principle lies with us today. The thief in this context is the false teachers. I get that. But who is their master? Who is the one behind all this? Folks, we are not so blind that we cannot see. It's Satan. Satan works in the world to teach falsely. To teach the wrong ideas of who God is. To tell you it's okay to make up your own God and worship Him because that fools the Bible. It doesn't. God has revealed Himself in the Bible and He is who He is. He said what He meant, meant what He said. This is God and He's revealed Himself. So the thief working for Satan comes to do three things, to steal. That is a word that means to take away with stealth. You're not going to see it. They're not going to come up to you and say, hey, I'm here to steal your relationship with God. They're going to do it with stealth. They come to kill. That means to sacrifice or slaughter. They want to sacrifice your relationship with God. Folks, we are here to think of these relationships differently. My relationship with God is different than the world's relationship with God. See, some people think that God reveals himself through miracles and mysteries still today. God reveals himself in truth. Thy word is truth. Not in miracles. God works in the world, but he doesn't reveal himself through those miracles. He reveals himself in his word, the truth. We think of that relationship with God different than the world. And then to destroy, it means to put an end to, to ruin, to render useless. Do you see that? That's what Satan and his army of false teachers is coming to do, to render our relationship with God as useless. Ouch. That hurts. Because we have to be wise. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, James is very clear of the change in that relationship and where that relationship should be. James chapter 4 and verse 4, very easy to remember because that's where James says, you adulteresses. Ow, another one of those things that hurts. He says, do you not know that the relationship with the world is hostility toward God? Different relationship with the world. Different relationship with God. He says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I used to be that person, folks. I used to be. I didn't think I was an enemy of God. But, oh, yeah, I forgot to look at what God says about that relationship. And when I found out about that relationship, I said, I want to change. I mean, I didn't go to McDonald's asking for change. I'm talking about getting change from God. That is transformation. So this new relationship, right? It keeps us safe. This new relationship that we have with God in the world, that world is no longer, I'm not bound to it. And, and, and why adulterous? Why, why are we adulteresses? Well, because we left a relationship with God to go back into that relationship with the world. I don't have to get graphic about that. But that word wishes helps us with that because that word wishes, it means to make our minds up. I am, not, I am going to leave this relationship with God to go back to this relationship with the world. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, 
Keep on running around this Bible with me. We'll get to a point someday. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 reminds us, and do not be conformed. And, and let's read that right. Stop being conformed. You see? Stop being conformed by the world. How do you do that? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think differently. The renewing, the renovating. That's where, that's where Justin came up with this title. I think it was her and Tina that came up with this one. Renovation upstairs, right? Renovating the way we think about things. This relationship with the world. I'm not going to let the world mold me, conform me into their image because I'm going to think differently about my relationship with the world and my relationship with God. You know, there's a saying, and I say it all the time, if we can change the way we look at things, the things we look at will change. Are we changing? Do we see change? I mean, not only in ourselves, but in how we relate to the things around us. This is what God is crying out for us to be part of. Change. Stop letting the world mold me into what they want me to be. Let God's love mold me to be the people that God wants me to be. Let's begin looking at the new year by saying, I'm going to change how the way, how I look at things. I'm going to have these relationships differently. It's going to be different. I'm going to make a point of that. Because I see reality a little bit different than the world. I see it definitely. Now, we've heard it all the, you know, that's a gray area. No. There's a definition. There is a definite to God's reality, folks. And there is no gray area. You know, people say that the book of Romans, I love it. It's a hard book. No, it's an easy book. It's hard when my heart gets hard. It's hard when I don't want to do what the book's telling me to do. And that goes with any book, Revelation all the way, Genesis, all of them. They're hard when I don't want to accept what's being said. It's very easy once I come willing to be molded, once I come willing to, to change. These accounts that we read of in these Bibles, uh, you know, David killing a giant, Moses, God, parting the Red Sea. So, the Israelites could walk uh, through that water. Baptism of Moses, they were saved by going through the water. Right? Some guy had come up there and says, well, really, uh, there was a misprint by the scribes. It didn't say Red Sea. It means Reed Sea. Now, the Reed Sea is nothing more than a frog pond out here in your backyard. It's about that deep, and it has a bunch of reeds growing out of it. That's why it's called reed. And they say there was no miracle. They actually crossed the reed sea. Come on now. See, they don't want to look at reality the way that God has given it to us. Thy word is truth. That's not a fairy tale. That's reality. That's the way God works. He gives us the choice. And that's the greatness. Our God our, our, created us as creatures of choice. You made a choice today. Oh, you may be paying the price for it, but you made a choice to come and hear the preacher today. That's your choice. That's reality. Nobody made you be here. You chose to be here because you believe in the reality that God has set forth for us right here in the Word. I want us to turn in our Bibles. I want us to go to Matthew chapter 7. And I want us to look at that passage that we kind of looked at last week and the week before, and the week before. But it's worth looking at again. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Oh, not Luke, Matthew, cub. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. 
He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Folks, this is reality. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. See, we think of reality as definite. That's not a maybe. There is no gray area here. It's either you're on God's road or you're on the world's road. And we know in reality, this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't maybe. This isn't gray area. We know where each one of these roads lead. That's reality. We get that. We believe in the reality of a wide gate. We know where it's going. You know, we believe in the reality of a broad way. We get that. We understand that. See, our choice. This is our choice. What gate we want to go through. We can go through the world's gate. That's wide. What's that meaning? Whether there's any way of life, any way you choose to live. The conduct of life has no rules. It's kind of like going out to eat at the restaurant. There's no rules. It's just right. We don't want outback religion. We don't want an outback faith. We want reality. Reality's there. There's no morals. There's no guidelines. Live as you want. But here's the reality to that life. It leads to destruction. It leads to death. And you know what? It's very well populated. There's a lot of people. Flip side of that. We believe in the reality of a narrow gate. You know? I know you're looking at me and say, Cub, that's a narrow gate. You in trouble. Well, I wish these holidays would go away and I could maybe try trimming some of this off. And all these mug exchanges. Hey, guys, I had a great time yesterday. Enjoyed it very much, sidebar. And I wanted to say this, too. So stop the clock, Mr. Shows. It's been a year now. First of this month was a year anniversary for my family to be part of this great family here in Gilbert. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you, God, but thank you. It's been an enjoyable year, and we can't, we can't do anything but look forward to the many years that God has in store for us ahead. And if it's anything like that last one, we're in for a great ride, right? Thank you all very much. Appreciate that. But back to the point at hand, right? We believe in the reality. We believe in the reality of the narrow gate. And this is important because this, this is one of those things that, that caught me a little bit off guard, raised a hair on the back of my neck. Notice what he said, verse 13. He says, the narrow gate, the wide way, the broad that leads to destruction. But look at it. The gate is small. Now, that word small is the same word that we get the word narrow from in the previous verse. It, it, we get our word stenography. We've talked about that. But here, if, if you go on to read, he says, and the way is narrow. That's a different word. See how tricky it is to try to match a, a language with another language. I mean, the meaning is basically the same, but the idea here is that this is not uh, uh, like stenography restricted, but it means there's going to be afflictions. You're going to be pressed on. The road that we choose to go with Jesus is just like him. It's kind of like a wine press. And I believe we've seen what the wine press did to Jesus. It pressed the blood out that saves us from our sin. It wasn't an easy life. And folks, we believe in the reality of that, that, that narrow gate. We believe in the reality of a narrow way. We believe that this is not a gray area. This isn't an if or maybe this is the way it is. And I choose to go with Jesus on this road on this journey and the greatness of this journey is that it brings people like janine into my life oh it's pressing there's some difficult times but it brings people such as barb in my life and it reminds me of how beautiful my god is and yes there's difficult times and then i think well if i've been on the other way and i go oh wait a minute they go through the same things we go through only their house is built on sand and boom it goes and ours is built on the rock jesus christ and it stands and it stands through eternity because we believe in that reality because we believe in what god has taught us that the life with morals is good the life with restrictions it's good the life that has rules in marriage that's good 
You know what the rules of marriage is, right? One man, one wife for life. There's one reason to divorce, and that is for fornication. We get that. That's reality. There's no gray area. That's reality. That's hard. Even Jesus' disciples tell man, in this case, nobody's going to be saved. Oh, what's impossible with man, all things are possible with God. Believe in him. Trust in him. And he will see that you are glorified. Glorify me, Father, as I have glorified you. God glorified Jesus the day he raised him from the dead. And he'll do the same for us. If we use what God has given us to glorify him, to believe in his reality, to, to stand up for the truth that he offers, and to realize that the other road leads to one place. It's called destruction. And we don't want that. We don't call it a gray area. We call that an area that I don't want to be part of. It's reality. And this is the time of year that my reality starts setting in, you know, because I'm like, yeah, I like shopping. I like to go out shopping and spend money as long as it's somebody else's money. See, reality is it's not somebody else's money. And reality is that God has given us a life that leads to eternity with him. The reality of the other road is that it leads to destruction. And we believe in that reality so much that we want to take this message to the lost and help them to get off that road, to come and find the road that's illuminated, 119 Psalm verse 19, illuminated by God's truth. And that every step we take is illuminated through his glory, knowing that we're headed in the right direction. Yeah, folks. We think of reality with a definite, a definitely to reality. And our response when we see things with our relationships and reality, then our response is deliberate. I know what I'm doing. I know what I did. I know what this is all about. I know this isn't about a pew. This isn't about a building. That wasn't about water. It's about God his son, and my relationship with him. That is a deliberate response. When God gave us the ability to choose, the choice is on. We get to choose. It's either his life or our life. Whichever one we want to choose. Jesus knew what his life was for. I want us to turn in our Bibles, John chapter 21. Let's go over there and look. John chapter 21, and I want us to look at verses uh, 18 and 19. Jesus teaching, and man, God had one son, and he was a teacher. And the things that he taught, and this is one of those things that just make you go, hmm, right? Because look at what he said in verse 18. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. You see? Look at verse 19. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, this is only for me, not you. Don't worry about it. Ah, uh, wrong answer. Carnella, that ain't what he said. He said, Follow me. See, when you were young, when you were immature, when you were not a Christian, you walked around and did whatever you wanted to do. You, you hung out with who you want to hang out. You hung out the places you want to hang out with. You did the things that you want to do. But when you came to God and said, I don't want to lead my life, I want you. What do you say? He's going to take you places where your flesh does not want to go. What was he speaking about? His death. He told us that. He said, my father's leading me to the cross. That ain't where my flesh wants to go, but that's where I'm going. Right? So it's a deliberate response. Now, that being said, turn over in your Bible, Luke chapter 7, 30. Let's go running. Luke chapter 7, look at verse 30. Because a deliberate response can be wrong. In 7, 30, 
It says, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. That was their deliberate response. And guess what? It was uh, wrong answer because look at it says, not having been baptized by John. They didn't want that way of life. They didn't like that idea. No, 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 no. We're going to reject that. That's a deliberate response. But it was wrong. Deliberate response can bring great outcome. When I'm deliberate in what I'm doing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we, we probably hit that verse a million times today, make million one. Because in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we all know, you know, he says, and I love that because that's important. We know our lives are changed because of this knowledge that God causes all things to work for good to those who love God, deliberate, my response to God is to love him, not by accident, not in the world, but a deliberate response to say, I love God and give my life for him. Because look what else it says. And are called according to his purpose. Deliberate response. Bunky, we're not here for our purpose anymore, brother. We're here for God. And that's a deliberate response. If you're not here for God's purpose, then maybe you didn't make it. Maybe you did this. Hmm, did I really say that? Yeah, you did. You're supposed to have. It's supposed to be a deliberate response. And a de deliberate response. Folks, where does this come from? Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Reminds us where this comes from. Paul writing to the church in Philippi, his crown and joy, such as Sun Valley is to me, right? My crown and my joy. In verse 2, he says, make my joy complete by being in the same mind, maintain the same love, and unite in the same intent on one purpose, a proper understanding. This was not an accident. Paul made a deliberate decision to do this, to make this choice, to walk this walk, to follow Christ. Folks, I want to encourage you today. Your response to God was to be baptized to repent and be baptized so God can wash away your sins. And in that response, you made Jesus Lord. Is that a deliberate response? Or did you go, oh, I did that on accident. Whoa. I mean, I like Jesus and everything, but I don't know if I want him as my Lord. I like friends. No, no, no. The deliberate response was to make Jesus our Lord. Why? Because that's a covenant relationship. That's what covenant relationship's all about. Jesus put it out there for us, and we chose it. And hats off to you. It's a great choice. But Satan is working on us to minimize what that means to us. Folks, you mean the world to me. And your walk with Christ is everything to me. I find no greater joy than this, John wrote, to see my children, oh, God bless him, to see my children walking in the Lord. No greater joy than this. I want us to be deliberate in what we do. Know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and who we're doing it for. I want us to be as deliberate in our faith as I was on Thanksgiving Day. You understand? I mean, I was so deliberate on Thanksgiving Day that I'm starting to get a rash from the steering wheel on my stomach. That's pretty deliberate. I wasn't leaving until the turkey was gone. You know, what I'm saying is, folks, let's be that deliberate in our faith. Let's not let the world take us away. Let's not let the world fool us, trick us, deceive us to misunderstand God. You know, I got an opportunity to go to Bear Valley. And like Isaiah, I said, here am I, send me. I want to go. I want to spread the joy. I want to spread the knowledge. I want to change the way I think. You know, Cub 30 years ago would see you differently than what Cub sees you today. And that's all because of him. Because that's the way God wants us to see things. I want to throw three questions at us before we go. Do my actions show a different relationship with the world? Do they recognize that? 
Because if they don't see it, what's going to make them understand how important God is? Do I show a definite belief in God's way, truth, and life? Do people know where I stand? Do people understand that there's only one way? There's only one truth? There's only one life? Because that's who I am? Do my choices, do the things that I'm making choices in my life, do they show a deliberate effort to be like Christ? These are three questions that hopefully this sermon's had a chance to help us with. I want to encourage you today. You know, we got a new year coming up. What a great opportunity to put on a new life. If you're here this morning, you've not been baptized into Christ. You've not let God even start you in this new life. Oh, I, I, I know the intentions are good, but I don't need to tell you where the highway of intentions lead to, right? Let's make those intentions a reality. Let's let God have our life. Today, if we can help you, lead you to the waters of baptism, we want to do that. And if you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, let's not forget about that response that we Let's keep it deliberate. Let's know why we did it, and let's stay faithful to why we did it, and remember who we did it for, for our God. You know, Satan's working on us each and every day. We talked about that in class today. In fact, me and Jack made a decision. We're going to start working on some lessons to help us with anger because anger will pull us away from our decision, along with sorrow and everything else the world throws at us. If there's something going on in your life that Satan's trying to use to pull you away from God, maybe get you to doubt God, maybe not trust in his body, whatever it is, God is more powerful than anything you face. So this morning you get an opportunity to lay that problem or problems down at the foot of the cross. Say, here they are, God, please take them. And he said he will provide victory for us if we'll trust him. Today, if you'll trust him, please come forward, ask to be baptized. Trust him, let us gather around you and say a prayer with you. It's your opportunity now to come forward as we stand and we sing.